and uh, my name is Naran Patel. I'm an architect at uh, Cisco, and I'm going to be doing, doing this presentation with Gopi uh, Rebala, who's a CTO of OpsMX. So that's us two. So I'm going to skip over that. And this is what our agenda is going to be. So I'm going to talk about Cisco environment, some of the challenges and anti-patterns that we faced in our original CD 1.0 and uh, some of the goals of what we want for CD 2.0, uh, what made us choose Spinnaker, some of the journey and the challenges we've experienced so far, um, some of the lessons learned, some of the results that we've achieved so far. So just to do a level set, uh, we are about to go GA. We haven't gone GA completely, but we are leading up to that. And this is like learnings from nine months or so of work on Spinnaker leading up to going to GA. And so this is what we've learned so far, but there's a lot more results and lessons to be learned after we go GA. And um, some of the next steps for us, we'll start to talk about some of that. So this is our uh, CD 1.0 pipeline. And uh, we have a lot of uh, mutable tools in that uh, pipeline there. Um, and that worked really great for us in uh, CD 1.0. Uh, when infrastructure was managed by configuration management and you were throwing binaries and artifacts into um, VMs, uh, that was great. But with the arrival of Kubernetes and containers, um, some of this posed some challenges of how to operate. And so this pipeline, which served us really well for a long time and provided us tremendous value, started to have some issues. Right couple of things that I've described down below in terms of uh, prescriptive pipelines and high ceremony. There's just some of the conditions I've sort of summarized in this little um, blow up on top is we were very prescriptive in our pipeline patterns. We sort of, yes, we talked to a lot of developers and yes, we built some pipeline patterns and um, created those templates around them, but self-service was challenging and Modifying templates was difficult, and so you needed a lot of understanding and knowledge on how to change those um, processes to really uh, make it useful to you or adapt them to your processes. And so that was a bit of a problem for us. So we couldn't scale to support that much self-service and so much programmability. Um, so we had low or poor self-service, and the programmability of the trying to think about things like pipeline as code wasn't really there techni technically. And so we couldn't hand that over to development teams and it made for friction. So that's some of the challenges that I talk about there in terms of non-intuitive UI, UX friction, and it was a love-hate relationship. Some people liked it and a lot of people actually didn't. So we were trying to solve that problem with what we're trying to do in the future. Uh, Works well on mutable infrastructure. That's great, but it doesn't work so well on immutable. And we did a hacky, hacky solution to try to introduce Kubernetes and uh, OpenShift into the environment, but it didn't work very well, and I knew that that hacky solution was gonna, not going to last. So it gave us some time, some breathing room to think about what does the future look like. What we did want was you know, API first, but even though we had some API first, um, it was challenging in terms of re resource managing and provisioning and things like that. Um, just managing uh, an ancient infrastructure, which is what Urban Code is built on, um, was um, difficult or, or difficult for support operations to maintain. Um, so that wasn't really great. And so I think we wanted to shift and pivot towards agentlessness. Um, and some of that is what we're looking at in the future as well. Um, the other challenges were, as people are shifting from and pivoting from continuous delivery to continuous deployment, how can we reduce the amount of ceremony and increase the amount of velocity of change and um, do that in such a way as that we can scale that out? So those are some of the other things that we were thinking about. So why Spinnaker? Well, for us, um, I think everyone recognizes that multi-cloud is a big deal. It's not just a buzzword. People are actually doing dev test in cloud, but they're also thinking about hybrid, hybridization of their workloads. And if that's not right now, that's going to be there very soon. Uh, deployment strategies, um, I got told by several users that, can you do blue-green? And right now, for us, that's a cobbled together script to do that. It wasn't in an imperative first-class operation in a deployment tool. So that was kind of important, because people were asking for that. Zero downtime. Um, for business is important, 
And so a lot of the deployment strategies coming out of the box of Spinnaker was in, interesting for us and uh, helped us achieve some of those goals, right? Um, so if an application is distributed and wants to deploy anywhere, that's table stakes again. It leads back to the multi-cloud ability. And then some things that were really interesting or future-facing uh, were these uh, runtime analytics and then actions or actionable behaviors of some of those runtime analytics. So that's kind of an interesting thing, not just fire and forget, but fire and observe and make corrective actions. That was some of the um, design patterns we were seeking. And then um, the whole developer experience on um, what we'd built on top of Urban Code was just wasn't going to fly with a lot of the developers. And we talked to some leading developing teams, and they just found that the experience they were having wasn't the type of experience that they wanted. Right? Um, and pipeline is code, declarative everything. That's kind of the um, not only is it infrastructure, but it's also pipelines. Um, it's also how you deal with configuration management. So that is kind of the imperative. Everything needs to be programmable and everything needs, everything needs to be exposed as such. And these are some uh, non-functional requirements. I'm, um, I'm not really going to talk about these a lot. Um, I think branching first was an important aspect uh, to deliver different types of artifacts in different pipelines. And this, this is another pattern of Spinnaker that makes that really easy. Um, dealing with state and stateless is uh, another thing that's kind of easier with Spinnaker because it can treat um, V2 method, um, let's say, baked uh, binaries or binary artifacts alongside V2 manifest Kubernetes workloads as both first-class operations. So if you have stateful workloads as well as stateless workloads, um, it can deal with both of those as, as a collection of pipelines as, part, as associated with an application. So that was kind of attractive, that we could deal with uh, state, stateless, um, as pipelines and a lot of abstraction there could be leveraged. And then finally, the extensibility of Kubernetes, of Spinnaker was really uh, amazingly um, advantageous so that we could bolt on some of the chaos engineering, reliability engineering, uh, leverage the new uh, uh, analytics that they're uh, pushing into uh, um, all the events that are coming out of Spinnaker and um, using that information to either do uh, automated canary analysis or other actionable analytics. That was kind of very interesting for us as well. This is what our 2.0 pipeline kind of shapes itself up to be. Uh, a couple of things have changed there. You'll see that there is a, um, essentially a, a repo there, Quay, which is uh, essentially an image repo for Kubernetes images. Um, and we're using that uh, from CoreOS as a, a repository instead of Artifactory. Now, we could use Artifactory, but Quay came with Claire and a few other features built in, which allows for automated security scanning of images. And so that was an attraction. Uh, we may change our minds and switch over to having parallel pipelines, but that's just something as uh, apparently is some choice that, that we have here now. Um, we displaced uh, Urban Code you, de you deploy with Spinnaker. And then we, if you notice, the release is not there anymore. So that's a kind of interesting thing. When I talk to um, our release management organization, we are trying to leverage Spinnaker now for releasing, which is curiosity because it's more of a continuous deployment continuous delivery tool. So what about releasing? So that we're still trying to fashion what that means and how to simplify releasing. Um, and if you look at some DevOps patterns, they, they talk about you know, feature flags and they talk about um, how to do dark releasing. There's a lot of other techniques that you can use to maybe make release really simple and a trivial act activity that you don't need any heavyweight release tooling. So that's kind of what we're exploring there. And then finally, the verification thing is something really future-facing exploratory for us to look at Kyanter and tap into that, um, maybe look at Chaos Toolkit as a mechanism of, of doing chaos engineering and then Gremlin, and then play off those two to see if they can help on any of that um, uh, that we have down, further down in the roadmap. Um, the top bar over there is CSDL, which is essentially continuous software um, deployment um, um, is really about continuous security, right? So baking in security all the way through the pipeline and not only 
um, looking at like uh, threat analysis right at the beginning when you're developing your product, but also uh, uh, scanning your source code um, um, look, and firing off different types of um, uh, scans uh, for source and uh, libraries, and then looking at your re repository for any runtime uh, vulnerabilities, and then finally um, anything that pops up at um, um, actual scanning of uh, the runtime states of containers or uh, images um, actually deployed in, say, a, a virtual a virtual machine and looking for any vulnerabilities there. So that's like a full spectrum continuous security view on top. Um, so we, 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 what kicked this off? Well, the, the whole transformation between 1.0 and, and 2.0 was we took a strong look at CNCF and the whole quadrant on CICD and we started to dig into all these different tools out there a couple of the more recent one, Brigade and Argo, a couple of that not there, but I've paid some attention to more recently. But we continue to look at that. There's different patterns in there, um, like GitOps um, for GitLab is really something that's really grown up more recently, and it's still very attractive for us. And we may still look into that for certain types of developer experience. But out of the rest of them, the only, the strongest candidate for us uh, seemed like Spinnaker compared to all the others. The others were either had one or two cloud provider support, not the 10 or so that Spinnaker supports, but they also were not quite advanced in other features. So um, right now we feel that it's the most um, um, candid, highest uh, functional candidate that we have out of CD tools out there from the open source lens, not from the commercial lens. There are some commercial tools that uh, are pretty good. Uh, Codefresh comes to mind. Um, but in, and go from um, uh, ThoughtWorks. But uh, Spinnaker from an open source sense was one of the most powerful. And we wanted to try and to reduce some of the cost of operations of CD because we didn't want a penalty of if you follow best practice and do more deployment, you should be penalized. Um, so we wanted to, it was an attraction to say that if you do more deployments, um, it doesn't cost you any more to do that. So that was one of the other attractions is that we can scale up and scale out and you can do more deployments, maybe 10,000 a day and, and it doesn't cost you any more, right? Other than the bandwidth, I suppose. Um, and so we did a POC. I did a POC last year around October time frame um, and the execs loved it. So they told me, when can you have it ready? So now I had the challenge of like, okay, they liked it. Uh, how can I make this real, right? So that was the beginning of the journey. And um, these were some of the considerations on that journey was, uh, okay, so now I have a mandate to go ahead and make this real, but I know I can't do it by myself. There's a lot of knowledge that needs to be learned here. Uh, okay, so now uh, who out there has um, knowledge about this stuff? And so one of the uh, groups was uh, OpsMX and the other group was Armory. So I went down and reached out. Um, I read about Spinnaker and I noticed there's this little paper in there called DSD spec, which was a manifest V2 spec before it actually materialized and actually was anything. And so I started to subscribe to that, was very interested in that. Uh, but at that time, Armory wasn't really supporting that as part of their release, and it was still being worked on. But that was what I wanted to actually launch with, a V2 provider for Kubernetes um, manifest-driven deployments, because I felt that that would provide a first-class uh, Kubernetes uh, deployment um, and tightly bind that to the Jenkins experience and allow both programmability from Jenkins as well as the Spinnaker perspective. Um, and that was kind of where we wanted to um, try to launch with. Um, Armory wasn't providing that, but OpsMX said, we'll provide you support for the latest stable uh, um, uh, open source version. And so I said, OK, that sounds good. Uh, why don't you help us build that and make that? And so we, we've been working with uh, the OpsMX guys for a little while, so a little plug for them. Um, and they've been helping us put the pipelines together and, and uh, from a product standpoint, make. Spinnaker worked with OpenShift. Now, it didn't just work. It needed some configuration to make it work. Uh, some of the uh, uh, challenges there were that OpenShift has um, some configuration on top and some modules on top in terms of security management and stuff. And when Spinnaker actually talks to it um, and you tighten up all of the permissions and the security model inside of OpenShift, it buffs. So you have to figure out, okay, so what is it complaining about? What is the security permissions complaining about? And so we, it wasn't a, a non-trivial exercise to figure out 
how do I actually make Spinnaker to work with OpenShift by figuring out what are the security permissions allowed per project, per namespace, and how do I operate that at scale? So that was some of the challenges there, and we had to figure out what are the permission structures that we can omit, we can bind to, and uh, to allow Spinnaker to Halliard and its uh, account services to operate. Uh, and then from there, we went and started to actually dig into the application side. Um, some of the deployment infrastructure that we're going with is we're deploying on uh, OpenShift 3.9. We've built uh, Spinnaker in such a way as that we've got a primary instance and a HA instance. Um, Spinnaker's not any clustering, it's got any fancy, so we've just done some active passive setup. Um, and that comes with its own caveats, and maybe Gopi can go into a little bit of that. It is non trivial. It is challenging because partial state is stored inside of Redis, and the rest of it is in Minio, which is an S3 store. And um, there's some challenges in there because if things break, then you lose runtime state in Redis, and it's not as simple as just fetching the data back from. Uh, Minio and you're there and ready to run, you actually lose runtime state. So uh, again, that's something that we're still continuing to explore and to make sure that we don't lose anything and we can come up cleanly. cleanly. Um, we did some fail back and fail over testing and that sort of worked quite well under control conditions. But like I said, uh, you will lose um, some state information in, in Redis, which you do need to kind of think a little bit more strongly about how to, how to uh, figure that out. Um, and then we were looking at, um, when we installed Spinnaker, we realized that um, this is a non-trivial exercise because the documentation is not that great. And we found that um, we needed to script some of it. So we ended up scripting how to do Halyard, ended up scripting how to do installation of Spinnaker and all its microservices, and then all the secrets and the config maps. And, and we ended up kind of automating a lot of it. And so we realized that if we just wrap that whole thing and all those scripts together and just um, um, put some command line tool around it, we can actually kind of install Spinnaker on the fly wherever we want. And so uh, we treat that as our ability to uh, um, do Spinnaker as a service and on demand wherever we want it, wherever we point to in terms of OpenShift or, or raw Kubernetes cluster uh, we can just run this script and it installs Spinnaker and it's working and set up and it's kind of cool. So that allows us to um, scale out instances when we want. Um, maybe it's not a big deal, it's just a script. We could even just go, hey, good guys, have fun. And, and people could use that. Um, it's, it's, again, it's not a big deal. It's, it's just cobbled together best practice on Spinnaker management. Um, and I'm sure that uh, Gopi wrote the script. so. Gopi, if he feels comfortable in just throwing it out there, I don't know if he wants to keep it like, hey, hold on, that's, that's stuff we want to keep for our professional services. Uh, it's up to him, but it wasn't, it wasn't a huge deal, but it was a lot of learning that we put into it, which was kind of nice. Um, Gopi, you want to talk a little bit about this? Sure. Thanks, Naren. So Naren was talking about high availability deployment for the Spinnaker and what the challenges are. So as we progress through it, in the enterprise, we had to integrate with a bunch of the services that are already there in the Cisco. Um, so we went through all of that here. There were some challenges there because of the documentation issues. Huge organization, Jenkins runs a thousand plus jobs. The default configurations don't support those kind of things, for example. We went through all of that, but uh, the deployment itself uh, is one huge cluster with service accounts for different departments that are pointing to that cluster deploying it. You know, the Spinnaker setup, we have an active passive. Uh, Spinnaker itself can run across multiple availabilities or uh, regions, but the way we are deployed because of uh, the databases, Redis and Minio, uh, we set up the replications for the databases in active passive mode, and similarly, the Spinnaker itself runs in active passive mode. Um, so we had the issues where the whole region went down, and we had to bring up the secondary, and then once the region comes back up, we can pull it back in. Uh, and the way the switch also happens is there is a vanity URLs for the global that we can set to replicate a cluster once the primary goes down. Uh, and we can start using it. But the challenges here are, it's not a zero downtime uh, because of the way active passives are set up today. Uh, there are 
<laughs> new things that are coming which are not there yet in the production, uh, where the Redis itself uh, can be in individual zones, you can have Redis in active passive, right? A master slave configuration, and then replicate it to the next. But if the region itself goes down, that does not help. Uh, so the Redis right now, what is being done is break up the Redis into two different parts. One goes through SQL Server, which can be replicated uh, without loss of data. And then when you switch back, you don't lose the state information of the pipeline. So those things are not done yet. Right now, it's an uh, active passive mode uh, in simple replication with Redis and Minio and switch off the regions if the one of them fails. Yeah, I think just to add, add to that, that's active work in terms of state recovery right. in some of the microservices, respecting that and backing it up into, into SQL. Um, and this is just little weaknesses that we found. And uh, the other weaknesses we found is um, Cloud Drivers uh, resource hog. It's, it's a real dog for resources. And the more accounts you add on, it just really tags onto time in terms of coming up. And so you have to do a counterbalance between the amount of accounts that you put into Cloud Driver and the resources that it consumes uh, versus the number of spin occurrences and the clients that you put into them. Um, and it's a fine balance between the two. And that's, I think, somewhat, and that needs some work. Uh, and the other is um, not putting all your eggs in one basket. I think distributing some of your clients and your lines of businesses in different um, spin instances allows you not only to uh, scale and support and reduce the risk to each of those operating lines of business, but also allows you to manage some of the scalability concerns and performance concerns. So you do have to kind of weigh that up and measure it up for yourselves. We're doing some scale testing um, right now, uh, just throwing uh, accounts into uh, the service, bringing it up, and just monitoring how it behaves, how long it takes to uh, come up, and doing some timing tests around that, um, and also running pipeline jobs at scale programmatically to see how that behaves as well. So there's different types of scale testing that we do. I strongly urge that if you have um, an environment um, where you think that the one instance is going to scale or if you think it's 10 instances is going to scale, do the scale tests. You'll realize that whether it's your Halyard uh, number of accounts or a number of those that are mapped to a uh, number of Spinnaker instances, is if you have not done some measure of that and some sizing of that, you might run afoul. And uh, that's some of the things that we want to make sure we have a good handle on. So as we operate and scale, uh, we know what the number of um, um, tenancies that we have in terms of namespaces and projects per instance and how that operates and also the number of accounts that we have pointing to different clusters and number of instances of Spinnaker itself. So that, that's kind of the balancing act you have to do, but the scale testing hopefully will give us some good numbers to size that out. Uh, I'm not talking about vertical, I'm talking about horizontal scaling as well. Right. right. So the cloud driver itself, you, you can have multiple instances running. Uh, there are, there's a huge amount of traffic between a cloud driver and Redis uh, because of the caching and the frequency at which it does. You have some parameters that you can tune with like uh, having a number of parallel threads that are running in individual cloud driver instances, multiple cloud drivers. Uh, but so those are the things that you need to watch out, like uh, Naren was saying, you need to measure those. And yeah, do you, um, I'm just going to go through this real quick and hand over, okay? A um, couple of things that, just to call out here, uh, we did the enterprise integrations, so you can see that, pretty common stuff. Um, install and upgrades, a scripted automation. We did that because, like I said, and because the project changes so rapidly, we needed to have a sandbox where we could do some sanity checking and then a dev stage prod instances of Spinnaker and then um, you know, staging uh, baked out with HA and that to be tested and then the production and all of that. Uh, that means that you need to have a significant amount of Spinnaker environments to make sure you're life cycling Spinnaker itself. The project is evolving very, very rapidly. It's something like a couple of releases every two or three weeks. So uh, what we do is we throw it into sanity checking and run some tests against it just to see if all the stuff that we put into pipelines and stuff works before we start promoting it out. And that's something that um, we've run afoul with, with just getting a little too eager of getting the new version in. Um, I, I would suggest that you have some sort of life cycling of Spinnaker itself and that you're validating and testing your pipelines that it's all working because um, it's somewhat brittle still. Some things that were working in the previous release 
don't work in the next release, and uh, you don't want to run afoul of that, especially if you've got a lot of clients on there. You want to kind of make sure that the product's working as it should, right? Um, the other problem that the way, way um, uh, our security guys decided that OpenShift needs to be set up is they force the, um, the invalidation of all tokens that you use to access Quay every 24 hours. So um, that means Spinnaker itself can't operate against Quay all of a sudden. So that kind of causes us problems when we've got like a, let's say, a, a thousand tenants. Uh, all of a sudden, all thousand can't operate. So we had to set up a regen token service we built ourselves just to inject the regen tokens into the pipeline so we, we can always continue to operate. And so we know we need to have you know, these, these, these things inserted, um, but we built a way of work around, uh, around that security premise. I don't think it's ideal, but it's a way of us working around it. Um, and it avoids this sort of friction with the user community. Finally, the whole Halyard, Spinnaker, Wrapper, Facade APIs is our stab at doing enterprise one-click uh, pipeline invocation. And so um, I think Armory talked about you know, one-click provisioning of pipelines. That's kind of our stab at doing that. We created a Facade API across Spinnaker API, uh, APIs, and we exposed to our provisioning services and a CLI um, the ability to just craft your pipeline, and um, um, the Facade API take care of that work. There's an event queue and there's some funky stuff that happens between it, so it tries to make sure that uh, it completes all of the provisioning services, otherwise it fails and somebody acts upon it and we'll, you know, we'll think about how to do better behaviors around that. Um, um, yeah, and we built a compliant SOX uh, um, process, which is an as-is process into the pipeline, um, and we do have a SOX colleague in here, or of ours, um, and it's uh, pretty much the same process that we do on our previous pipelines, but we've baked it into the Spinnaker pipeline, um, and it requires some approvals and such, um, and it captures some of that data, and uh, the event data going through uh, Echo will be sent over to some analytics that we have, and we'll be using that to uh, essentially provide audit, audit, auditable data, but also the runtime data to say the appro right approvals happened at the right time with the right people. Um, that's all I think I wanted to talk about that. Want to talk about this? Want to take over? Want come with it? Uh, so here, uh, so the expectation was that because we support Kubernetes with the Spinnaker, you point Spinnaker to a OpenShift cluster which is built on Kubernetes base, uh, should just work. But we found some of the issues uh, that make it difficult uh, in the initial go. The biggest one was the security considerations. Uh, in OpenShift, it, it expects anonymous user in each of the containers. And so initially, a few months ago when we were starting it off, the Spinnaker itself was using root for some of the containers. And then that was changed to non-root. Uh, and even that is not sufficient because some of the users, like the Spinnaker user, uh, were expected because of the environment variables and how it uses it. So we took that and, and the second thing is the, because of the security constraints, you cannot install something from, say, public domain. It needs to be approved and it, it needs to go through some checks so that are there within the quay of Cisco. So we built uh, the wrappers around that would change the user to an anon anonymous user for the containers, for this, uh, the releases, and uh, we deploy it through the Cisco Quay. So those were the automation part that we have done uh, for uh, whenever there is a release, you just run the script, it will go do its magic, generates the config file, applies that to Halyard, you can run Hal deploy, and that deploys the whole cluster for the new release. And, <clears throat> and single sign-on is another issue that came through for the open shift. Where Cisco has this ability of doing uh, two-factor authentication, that's SSL endpoint. So, but then if you do that, the Spinnaker itself cannot accept that. So we had to make changes there to have the authentication directly done, SSL termination, but authentication done in Spinnaker. But we, all, we are going to implement uh, the two-factor authentication with SAML in the Spinnaker directly. That part is coming. Right? And there were a few other things like 
because OpenShift supports its own constructs like route and deployment config, they were not working initially uh, with the Spinnaker releases. We worked with the community. Now those are all supported. Uh, and, <clears throat> and the scaling of the Spinnaker was what uh, Naran was talking about, uh, large number of namespaces. Uh, with, particularly with the Kubernetes v2 because of the caching mechanism and going through all the checks for all different kinds for permissions before it caches. That takes some time and we need to make sure the way we deploy and allocate time number of threads and all of that corresponds to what you expect uh, within that. And right? okay. the monitoring Spinnaker, Spinnaker has this uh, Prometheus. Just to endpoint. add a little bit to the cloud driver restart. Uh, that can take 10, 15 minutes, depending, and it's a, it's a number of accounts, scales, uh, it takes a long time. So um, that means that cloud drive is unavailable. Right? When it's trying to come up, it's unavailable. So that's a problem that obviously we have to figure out and, and, and make sure that we can sustain cloud driver even if we're making account changes. Um, and that problem has not been solved. So we're still thinking about how to solve that. Maybe you have two of them running and you stage one and you bring the other one up while the other one's still working on the older cans and then while, and then when you, and the new one's over, it switches over with blue-green, we're still figuring out how to make that work. Right. So essentially go with the blue-green when you restart uh, cloud driver. The existing cloud driver with accounts that it's running with continues to run and with the new accounts when you bring up a new one, it, it takes some time. So essentially whenever there is a new account being onboarded, it takes so that much amount of time for them to see the changes that are coming up. Right? And monitoring uh, is, again, with the Prometheus. But here also the trick is because we have active passive clusters, we can now use the monitoring within the cluster as well as across the clusters to identify if there are, uh, the whole region goes down, then we have the monitoring from the second one uh, that can identify that. Right? Um, our back issues are one of the hardest ones. Uh, Spinnaker uh, has uh, two types of uh, security with the accounts themselves has some security uh, built in with read-write access. And then there is a application level read-write access for the users. Uh, and the third one is about the service accounts for manage service accounts for running the pipelines. So when the trigger comes in, uh, because there is no authentication that's happening at the trigger time, we can set up which account that it uses to run the pipeline. So that has some side effects that are unintended. It was not really designed for the security, but more in terms of uh, usage. So, so those are some of the things that we are working through and trying to figure out what's the uh, right thing to do. For the moment, we have that service accounts, managed service accounts. Uh, we're looking at admin account as a workaround that allows us to update those accounts when there are changes while it is being set as a service account. Okay. Um, SOX compliance, it's a manual judgment. Let's say the account, this pipeline is triggered by account one, then uh, you can have a manual judgment that's set to have a privilege escalation. So only certain group of people who have the privilege to escalate it and escalate, and that's the context it would, it would run the deployment with. And so uh, then you can control how the deployment goes through with the privileges. Right. This is application onboarding. This is the one-click deploy that Naren, Naren was talking about. There was this facade API with the integrations with existing deployments. Uh, we have the configuration. Now you can create a pipeline with user input, single click, uh, that creates a pipeline in Spinnaker that allows you to deploy uh, straight to the deployment uh, clusters. You can have one or more clusters because we are creating the beginner or pipelines that allow to configure however you want. Yeah, I think just, just to add a little bit to the beginner and professional advance, what does that mean? Um, about 80% of our, our folks really aren't DevOps engineers and really don't give a crap about DevOps uh, when it comes to just getting their work out for the business. Um, they just want a pipeline that works. And so that beginner pipeline is just fully baked. It's not very complicated. It's, it's straightforward. It's baked in socks if necessary. And uh, it just gets them going. And that's a one-click experience. 
The professional and the advanced is some things that design patterns that we're still working on. What does that pipeline look like? For now, I think it's mostly going to be a lot of documentation on our part to provide those guidance and saying this is what the best practice is, community as well as what we've learned. Um, but we're working with certain advanced users to figure out how to codify that into uh, pipeline templates that they can use uh, time and time again for their particular applications, but also to evolve that. That's, a, I think, a community thing that really is something that's uh, not being looked at and not addressed. I talked to a few folks about some of that. Um, so there's a lot of um, thought process in uh, maybe promoting some of that to be um, uh, open sourced and, and just provide some pipelines that people can use for best practices around how, how they can get all these things hooked up and working. And managed pipelines, uh, if you're familiar with it, are the templates that are either stored in the Git or in the Spinnaker itself uh, that construct the pipeline and which, which you can run. When you go apply the changes to the templates, you can apply that to the Spinnaker pipelines and those get reflected. Right? Uh, so in a way, those get locked. Uh, if enterprise wants to manage the locked pipelines, there's one way you can do is have, have it in the Git that's uh, secured and from there you apply these pipelines and those pipelines cannot be changed by the users who actually execute them. Um, right? But it's a workaround, not exactly the secure thing, but uh, that can be used. And so in the summary of the lessons, uh, so our back is one of the big issues. Uh, you clearly need to automate the Spinnaker deployments, there are multiple releases that are coming in really fast, a lot of new features being added, uh, bug fixes that were done, it's a big community now. You need to make sure you have your own process to uh, deploy uh, in your test before pr promoting it to production. Right? Um, <coughs> there are some issues if you have one large account with the service account that's controlling multiple deployments, uh, there are issues with um, the performance like Naren was talking about, that you have to worry about. And there are a lot of improvements coming in that area, but there's still work in progress, a lot to look forward to and really needed. And the audit dashboard is one other piece. Right now, Cisco has a, a audit dashboard for the current CD1.0. A similar thing needs to be extended to the deployments that are going with Spinnaker. You need to know how many, you, you need to be able to measure what is the improvement, where the improvements need to come, where are the inefficiencies. So that's a critical thing that we have to do. Um, the pipeline management super admin account would be one of the ways to uh, work around. Uh, so this all back needs to be really thought through uh, for real enterprises where we, we have multiple requirements. It's, it's a, not a purely self-service kind of a model, right? Um, and centralized logging is a, very critical uh, for production stuff. Cisco has, uh, I think, Elasticsearch-based central logging that takes all the data in. Um, that needs to be really scaled and set up. I, I think we uh, wrapped basically FluentD um, and uh, forwarded it to the centralized logging so everyone has access to their um, logging services now, not just for file services with Elastic, but now you've got the FluentD logs for the ephemeral workloads as well. You just can't point it to a file, obviously. That's not going to work in an ephemeral environment. So the persistence of runtime to runtime instances of those workloads has to be forwarded or captured and then aligned and then visualized so that people can see where the failure happens because if it fails, it's gone. I don't know what happened, it's gone. I mean, so uh, all of that has to be connected and, and um, allowing teams to do their debugging when something crashes. And it's not unusual to see crashes. Um, crashes happen quite frequently, so you don't want to lose that data. All right. Uh, and Spinnaker is tested at scale. Netflix has been using it for some time now. We know it runs at scale. Uh, it's a quite feature rich, but there are a lot of hidden features that you need to figure out to get to the scale of the Netflix. Uh, so uh, the docs is one of the places I think it can improve. Um, and, yeah. yeah, I think so. Uh, we're going to be going GA um, literally in less than 30 days. And so that's going to be an interesting proposition by itself. So we are pulling hair, trying to figure out, can we really make this happen? Um, and, but we're here, so that's kind of interesting in itself. Um, we do have some scale testing to complete, like I said earlier. So that's um, some of the fine tuning that needs to come out of that, which we're still working on. Um, 
the, the one-click provisioning services, we're actually actively working on completing that. Uh, we're hopeful that we'll meet the target date for that to roll it out. It may shift um, the rollout by a week or so, but um, that's kind of our target there. Um, we're going to grow it. We're not just going to throw everybody on it in one grow. We're going to scale it out with a community of users to start with and then increase that size as we build up confidence and we start to uh, configure the scale and such. And then eventually, hopefully, we get our 1,500 apps on there, maybe more because there's a lot more refactoring going on and um, um, there's a lot more apps to, still being added. So, um, But that's kind of a, our estimate right now, number of apps that we have. It could be a little bit more. It could be... A, uh, maybe a little bit less, hopefully, if people retire apps, but that seems to be a really hard proposition, apparently. Um, uh, we support, we're going to support 5,000 developers. Mostly these are IT developers, but we do have quite a bit of interest from engineering. Um, IT, that has 25,000 plus developers, so it'll be interesting to see if some of them start to use it. We have some consolidated services between us now, so um, it's going to be, I'm hopeful, that they will use this um, environment as well, uh, but we'll see how that goes. A um, couple of fixes that we're looking for, I just put them out here in terms of, uh, actually we submitted a fix for, um, in Fiat for uh, a role for assignment of security. It was looking up LDAP, actually should be looking, looking up a Fiat an account itself when it wasn't returning the right response. So we found that bug and we submitted a fix and it got approved. So apparently it does work if you find a bug and get it approved by somebody. Um, the other problem was caching sync errors in Fiat and we're still working on a fix or looking for a fix for that. And then long-term stability, I feel for the project is still not there. It's um, still got bugs. So the way we're going to manage that is going to be we're going to slow down a little bit on the amount of spinnakers that we upgrade to um, unless it's really necessary. So we're going to slow down a little bit. Uh, and the other thing is we're, between versions of Spinnaker as we upgrade, we're going to do a lot more testing. So that's kind of uh, something that we have to put on ourselves um, to control some of the chaos. There's a few things that we have in the future. We want to do canary deployments with ACA and runtime, uh, runtime statistical metrics. And really that involves hooking up to a lot of runtime data and being able to um, really leverage the next generation of ACA and Kyanta. Um, and that's really leads me nicely into the second point here, um, is that there's a lot of data sources. We're not tapping into a half of them. We're not tapping into a lot of them. And so we really need to do that. And the benefit of that is to reduce the, the time to recovery from incidents and to generally reduce incidents. But the other side product of that is that Depending on judges that you use, some of them can result in false positive reduction as well. So that's an interesting thing that we need to tap on. It's really, really early days, uh, I think, when it comes to judges and comparing judges against each other and the data that they gather and what they can infer out of that data. So we're exploring that. Um, and then some things that got interested in, in terms of judges that uh, I talked to uh, OpsMX about is the different approaches, right? Statistical uh, and algorithmic reasoning v's neural net data and how do you leverage the two and how can they both solve the same problem and how does one solve the problem better than the other? So this is still, we're still scratching the surface there to see how people are evolving that um, in terms of uh, Kyanta judges. So there's going to be a lot of, I think, uh, innovation happening in that space um, and a lot of people going after, uh, you know, making sense out of the chaos of that data. Finally, um, we're, we're looking at introducing chaos engineering, which is, I think, in our interpretation, probably not as much chaos than it is reliability engineering, but it's uh, something that we're exploring, and not just from a software sense, but uh, more holistically from an infrastructure and application sense. So we're trying to figure out how does that work. I think pioneers like uh, Netflix are inspirations for us, and uh, we're using a little bit more modern developed um, software now, uh, to, to, to Chaos Toolkit as well as Gremlin, as well as the Netflix OSS. We're going to compare all of those and contrast and see which ones we can uh, leverage to solve which kinds of problems. Um, and um, finally, there's a couple of other points here. Um, integration with Istio, I think uh, that's really necessary because 
as everyone knows, um, all of these containers are really microservices, and there are microservice dependencies between each other. That's a lot of networking. How do you manage all of that? And how do you manage that at scale? So obviously, service mesh is helping solve and uh, reduce the amount of complexity, but also add a lot of value in, in making that happen and making it much more programmable to and conducive to the programmability of Spinnaker pipelines so that you can set those patterns in where you want to flex, let's say, blue-green or canary, um, how much you want to flow that traffic based on what results you're getting back and, and things like that and manage that at not just an individual microservice level but across microservices and across dependencies, right? Um, and then integrating to CD analytics, that's kind of a homegrown thing. Every event that comes out of anywhere in the, the pipeline or across CI, CD creates an event. We correlate, aggregate, we get lots of rich data out of that, and it's no different for using Spinnaker and, uh, and um, OpenShift. So we're going to do the same thing. We're going to grab all that data and be able to correlate and get uh, good user value out of that. And then Gopi talked about SSO.